Welcome to another episode of the Emulsion Podcast, a show for chefs who want to think better, increase their performance, and believe that it's possible to take lessons from what others have learned. I am your host, Justin Kana, and I'd love to continue the conversation with you from this episode on my online circle community. There you can share your two cents and learn about supporting the show on justinkana.com slash support. For your convenience, it's also linked up in the description of your podcast player. Let's get into the show. What is up, folks? My name is Justin Kana, and my guest today on the show is Corey Mintz, who is based in Winnipeg, Canada. He is a food reporter focusing on the intersection between what we eat with business and politics and farming and ethics and land use and labor education and culture. He has been a cook and a restaurant critic, so both sides of the coin. If uh, you folks can recognize any other people that have been on the show that have had experience in multiple industries, that's what you can expect from this conversation. I got connected with Corey through Ray DeLucci of the Line Cook thoughts podcast thank you ray for making this connection possible he said hey this guy Corey's writing a really interesting book one i think you should read it and two i think you should have him on the show because i think you guys would have a great conversation and that's certainly what happened here at least that's how i saw it if you enjoy this interview i highly recommend you check out my conversation with chris spear who also hosts a podcast called the chefs without restaurants podcast We talk about labor, we talk about working in professional kitchens, we talk about hesitancy in owning restaurants, and that's also something that Corey and I talk about. So if you want to cue that up as your next listen, I would greatly appreciate that. If at any point you would like to pause, you want to check out Corey online, you want to pre-order the new book, it's probably out by the time you're listening to this, you can definitely check out the show notes, which also include any of the other linkable things that we cover in the show. Those are always available on justinconnor.com slash media, or you can just check the description of the podcast player that you're listening to this on right now. That's enough intro. Thanks so much for being with me. Please enjoy this conversation. Corey Mintz. Yes. Welcome to the Emulsion Podcast. Thanks so much for taking the time. Thank you for having me, Justin. And congratulations on the book. I've had a intellectually stimulating and historically deep diving and quite frankly, like morally twisting experience in reading The Next Supper. And I'm really excited to dig into it. But as a fun way to get a potentially a sense of your background, you share that writing came to you, quote, through the side door as a restaurant critic. And so what has learning to write taught you or made possible that wasn't available to you just being a professional chef? <laughs> well, a lot. You know, I, I always I wonder if I'm when I use that phrase, the side door, if that means it. I've used that so many times. I wonder, is that an expression? Is it is that just me? I think, I think it's the third door is another reference where it's like you. Uh, and this is in relation to uh, standing at a nightclub. You can either go. Uh, through the bouncer Mm -hmm. you can be so astronomically famous that they just let you in or there's always like a third door right so your version is the is is the good fella scene of you know slipping 20s in everybody's breast pockets for the vip exactly other door whereas in my head i'm picturing uh when i was like 20 and i figured out how you could get into the movie theater through the alley door uh like a bunch of bums and and hooligans that's that's the sort of sneaking past the authority figures, three stooges perception I have of my career. But sorry, I I derailed you. And the actual question was, what has been possible as a food writer that wasn't as a chef? Correct. Well, I mean, they're they're two different careers. I mean, what's possible as a doctor that's not possible as a lawyer. Um, But for me, I, I just, I reached the end of my road as a cook when, um, one, I looked around the room and could see who was going to make it in terms of really not just succeed, but also thrive and be happy because this is what they wanted to devote 100% of their energies to. I could look around the room and, and sure enough, you know, I can today get in touch with those people because I still know them and go, right, you're leading a kitchen here. You're the, the head of culinary development at some corporation there. You are the head of fermentation at Noma. I was right, you know, 13 years ago that you people all had that drive uh, and I didn't. Uh, And that combined with, you know, like my late start and and also seeing what success looked like when I was very young in cooking school. I I, I did my two month, they called it an extern shift at the time, but I was in a restaurant for 12 hours a day. And I remember one day the chef, his wife brought his kids in and uh, I had, I, I remember thinking, oh, you have kids. Um, you've never mentioned them and Oof. you're here with me every day. Uh, and I remember they came in and they kind of played for an hour and years later after, you know, after years, you know, kind of cooking on the line and various successes and failures, 
I remember that being part of my decision-making process, remembering, oh, right, that's what success looks like. That's being on top. When someone brings in your kids to play with them, you know, play making pizza dough for an hour before you go back to your 12-hour grind. So uh, that just combined with my, my path that I was on caused me to say, let's, let's go do something else. Were there any resources that you found helpful during that time when you were, I mean, obviously that's a very conflicting place to be because you're, like you said, like spending so much time in this environment and you dedicate a lot of your life to this, but then it's this thing. And I think pandemic has caused a lot of people to have these conflicting thoughts of, is this right for me? A lot, a lot of people are asking Mm -hmm. those questions. So did, did anything um, help you in that process? You mentioned looking at other people and being like, oh, well, I might actually have different values than people who are choosing to do this as, as a career? I don't know if, you know, in terms of resources, I, I remember going to the two uh, writer journalist people I knew, I knew and saying, I, 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 I want to get out of cooking and I want to, I want to do what you do. And both of them sort of patted me on the head to say, Oh, that's sweet. You, you think this is easier than what you're doing. Um, or you think it will be, possible to get into this career. I mean, without being too condescending or telling me not to do it, they basically said, yeah, you're, you're, you're in for it. And this is, and also, by the way, you're going to an industry that has no more sort of support and encouragement for you uh, than what you're, what you're doing. But I, I think my position, it was less that I was moving towards something than that I was moving away from it. And as I moved away from knowing I didn't want to do that, I was, I, I simply asked like, what else can you do? Uh, and this is something that everybody in the restaurant feel, uh, if, if they get to that stage kind of questions, usually based on what other life experience, what other educational experience, what their social professional circles uh, hint at. Uh, because, you know, we all ask, what am I qualified to do? Who wants me? And too often our employers are kind of, not reinforcing the idea that our skills are transferable and that we're in such desire because they want to keep us uh, where we are. Uh, And for me, you know, I had no education, not even, you know, university degree. I I didn't have a a high school diploma, uh, but I just said, well, let's, let's just give it a shot. What have I always wanted to do? Writing. Let's, let's just go try. Do you find it ironic that you've actually spent arguably more time talking to restaurant people and like thinking about restaurants just in general than you probably ever would have in a, uh, like I said, philosophical sense, in an interconnectedness sense, in a day-to-day practicality sense than you did as a, as a professional cook? It's an interesting perspective. Uh, who knows, uh, where I would have gone had I stuck with that career, but, uh, you know, my experience so often talking to people in kitchens is that um, the world is very closed. It certainly has gotten much more open post um, social media, you know, uh, which I was just on the cusp of. That was all sort of starting as I was in kitchens. And at that time, um, it was pretty standard that you weren't allowed to have your phone out if you were allowed to have it in the kitchen at all during prep or service. Uh, whereas now, uh, you know, much like parenting, it seems like one of those things where you're like, sure, I'd love to tell my kids or my staff they can't watch cartoons uh, or they can't play on their phones while they're working. But what are you going to do? Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard. But I, I often find talking with people that um, the, the, the ones who really are going to be leaders and you can see it are the ones who are just thinking so far beyond what their initial circumstances are, you know, not that they're sort of not living in the moment, but the ones who are sort of looking at other kitchens, looking at other cultures, looking at other people within their own restaurants, right? Other people within the restaurant hierarchy to say, what can I be learning? And I, I can honestly look back and say, I was just trying to stay afloat. You know, I was, I was a terrible line cook. I was, not cut out for it. it it requires as you know just such such a level of not just physical but mental dexterity uh to pump it out and not only uh, was i not good at it um but the people who are good at it frequently enjoy it you know they get an adrenaline rush from it whereas i don't like i don't like horror movies i don't like going into something to say like i know that people like horror movies because it's fun to be scared i don't enjoy being scared 
by the machine pumping out chips and, you know, the chef or the CDC saying that we're falling behind and we better pick up the pace. That's just not fun for me. I mean, that's incredible, like self-awareness and playing to your strengths almost and just not trying to make the the industry shift to meet you where you're at. But it's almost like you you identify that you can still have a hand in the in the pot without you know, necessarily being on the line, which I think a lot of people get caught in because it is seen as like, this is the pinnacle of success in the industry of working a hotline or being an executive chef. When in reality, like you can still participate and be part of the ecosystem without killing yourself or, you know, like subjecting yourself to this work environment that you don't particularly enjoy. And, and yet a lot of people I think are now doing just what you suggest. It was not within my imagination to do that. But I think a lot of young people now are looking at the world and going, how can I change this to meet my needs? Uh, certainly like a lot right. of young cooks and young uh, entrepreneurs, you know, I mean, it's certainly as a result of the pandemic, people who found themselves in just the variety of circumstances that they did um, for reasons I'm sure you've discussed many times over the last 19 months, said, yeah, why don't I start my own thing and do it the way that I want to do? You lay out the book as kind of a compendium of genres of restaurants is what is kind of what I'll call it. And I've, I've, I've been pretty vocal about not wanting a restaurant in the standalone, single owner, single location sense of the business model. Am I suffering from just a misnaming problem? Does the restaurant still make sense? In all your research, there has to be a reason why you decided to call them all restaurants. Sorry, I wanted to take a, a step back. I wanted to see that I understood what you're talking about because I, you know, I, I, I separated restaurants into genres uh, for the purpose of this book, something that came out early in conversations where in my work, in my writing, I'd get feedback from, from the audience. And frequently there was a lot of what about ism where people would say, well, this issue you're talking about, this type of exploitation or tipping or oversaturation, whatever it is, it doesn't happen in this restaurant over here. And I would say that's a very different type of restaurant. Like this Sri Lankan restaurant in Scarborough is very different from the downtown restaurant where they pay, you know, a hundred dollars a square foot for commercial real estate, et cetera, you know, the, the chain restaurant full service. So I started segmenting them into groups like that. And I found that was really helpful to start to start sort of making the topics I wanted to talk about look less like, you know, that gif of Charlie Day from uh, It's Always Sunny of all the red string on a, on, on a cork board, the conspiracy theory of saying all these things are interconnected to say, okay, let's talk about each of these restaurant groups and some of the issues that are endemic to them, even though there's an overlap. Um, that was my reasoning. I think you just explained it a different way of looking at it. Do you mind just laying that out for me again? Well, I think that restaurant, similar to the word chef, has this over. It, it it's too broad of a brush. It's too big of an umbrella. There are way too many things that fall underneath mm -hmm. those umbrellas. That, as you kind of mentioned, the differentiations and the characteristics that separate one kind of restaurant from another kind of restaurant. In the same way that a um, a, a chef who's really gravitating towards like a two-star Michelin in San Francisco it has a very different skill set than a chef that has a barbecue trailer in Austin, Texas. But they're, you know, both called quote unquote chefs to the general public. Mm. Uh, but I, I kind of in later stages of my career in working in mostly fine dining places, when I started to see behind the scenes of how the numbers were working out and the working conditions like you talk a lot about, a lot about in the book were not aligning with my values or what I quite saw as a sustainable business model, I kind of wrote off restaurants in my mind. It's like, I don't want a restaurant. But I think what you've done such a good job of is like really turning my framing of them and like, oh, maybe I just don't want that genre of restaurants. Mm -hmm. Maybe I do want a restaurant. It's just this specific, like the, it, it opened up more possibilities for me as far as thinking about them. And I think that was that's that's healthy for someone like me because having my food served in to to the general population or to just people in general is a goal. Like that is something that gets me excited. It might just not be what I traditionally think mm -hmm. of as a restaurant. And so that's kind of, um, I, right. I enjoyed the fact that you, that you genrefied, uh, things. I think chefs should be genrefied a little bit more too, because that would help. 
hiring that would honestly to be able to know that you're i mean like musicians do it right like i i cool you play guitar but like what types of guitar ex experience mm -hmm. like what types of knowledge you have um is helpful right and so and if we were you know if we were collaborating on an economic report for a trade uh publication we would probably using a much broader umbrella term like food and beverage uh business hospitality to, you know hospitality ampersand tourism uh to cast the widest net possible because it can mean so many things i think i include water parks in some section of the book just to really lay out the spread and say it can be a lot of things and i think people are continuing to redefine what that means uh which is a i i feel like an important part of the conversation to have when you still have the general public who you know, use the term chef thinks that basically um anyone who works in the kitchen is called a chef and that was kind of the first five years of my writing career was in trying in vain to disseminate because people the word chef from everybody else in the kitchen people say oh you're a chef and i would always say yes i was a cook i did you know for six months or so i actually did run a restaurant and i was the chef but i mean i, I wouldn't I, I wouldn't walk away i wouldn't for the rest of my life say uh i, I earned that title it's like a rank you know in, in the military but as you say further to that you know if you're a hospitality recruiter you have a lot more questions than how many years experience you have. You want to know about, you know, large volume and different types of national cuisines. And like, what, like, what are your specialties? What size of a groups, what size of a group did you manage? Uh, all those things matter a lot more than just like, okay, so you chef, you love food. What, you know, what, what follows that? Speaking of decisions to make and, qu and questions to ask, why is knowing where our food comes from so important? Why is it important now or why has it always been important? I would say you have this great section about two thirds of the way in the book that talks about tips that you learn from some people that you met in your research and, you know, to help decipher these kind of like over PR corporate mumbo jumbo <laughs> claims that that people can kind of sometimes present when they're talking about where your food comes from. And so I think you lay out both cases, which is really helpful, but maybe maybe start with now and then fill in some of the gaps sure. with potentially some backstory on why I always. Just to, I just to fill the listener on, on, on what Justin's talking about, because we were recording the audio book last week and I got to do it, which was a treat. And when we got to that section, and I'm just reading verbatim, some of the actual posted on their website, uh, corporate social responsibility statement from some of these restaurants there's one from uh, a, a wing restaurant. I can't remember the name of the chain, but their, their, their CSR statement basically says, look, we can't promise there's no slavery in our chicken. But what we can say is that if we do find that there is, we will do something about it up to and possibly even including firing people. We, we might even go that far. And, and the engineers who rarely, I heard, I was like, is any of this landing with my audience of two people in the booth? They actually broke in and say like, is that fucking real? Is that, does, <laughs> does a restaurant website actually say that? It's so crazy. And I, I think that helps to illustrate uh, the, the, the importance of, of the question you're asking, which is why is it important that we know where our food is coming from. And, and the reason is because we so have so little relation to how it is produced, uh, as opposed to how we did a century ago, you know, at the beginning of the 20th century, I can't remember the number, but it's upwards of 40, maybe 50% of uh, the American workforce was working in some way in agriculture or food production. And today I think it's 1.7, something like that. So that's a huge drop. Obviously, there's a number of factors over the, the course of a century. Uh, the population of, uh, of, a, of a country that size, uh, like most countries, you know, migrated to urban centers. We, we, we industrialized farm production. Uh, one of the unexpected or just not really addressed consequences of that is um, sight unseen. We allowed the way we produce our food to become unhealthy for us, unhealthy for the people who grow it, unsustainable, all these issues that we're now reckoning with in the form of, of climate change, um, it, it, as it specifically relates to 
the restaurant industry in a way that I feel is kind of directly actionable. For the consumer, we get into that chapter, which is about um, fast food and chains, uh, the success of the coalition of Immokalee workers who in uh, Southern Florida, where I got to visit before pan the pandemic kind of ended my, my ambitions to travel across the States for this book, uh, I got to visit the place where 90% of America's winter tomatoes are grown and where people um, work to change conditions that in the early 2000s were described as uh, uh, the, the, the ground zero or the epicenter of human trafficking in the United States. That's how bad conditions were on tomato farms in wow. Immokalee. Uh, and they, through a, a variety of actions, but primarily realizing that the power to change their circumstances was not um, by fighting with the growers, the farmers, but with the buyers, which were America's biggest fast food chains and saying, we want you to pay one penny more a pound to change our lives and to then boycott those chains and bring the public on such a simple message. And they succeeded. They got that penny a pound. They got McDonald's, Burger King, Pizza Hut, Subway, et cetera. And, and all the industrial uh, food service providers like Sodexo and Aramark and those companies, they got them all onboarded and changed the way uh, tomatoes are grown and how workers are treated in that sector. And on that, you know, and that happened because these very smart organizers realized how to do it and because they managed to succeed in getting a buy-in from the public, to, if, in getting people to care about something. You talk about a couple of the things that people can look out for or kind of just keep in mind. Uh, I, I'll, I'll read them here, and then you can either potentially elaborate on them or give some additional context if, if needed. The first one is to watch sure. for weasel words that PR <laughs> people sometimes can potentially use. The second one is to avoid self-certification. And then the last tip is to ask for the names of suppliers. Can you mm. maybe just discuss why each each one of those are, are important or any additional context? Because I think it's helpful to keep sure. in mind. Yeah. I, I mean, the Weezu word is uh, not something I encountered until I started writing, where I had an editor sort of, I can't remember what it was, but it was, uh, you know, my first job as a, as, as a writer was as a restaurant critic. Um, and I spent two years doing that. And I remember an editor kind of going over my copy in the early days when I, I really needed a lot of help and I was fortunate enough to get it. And they would circle these qualifying words like almost or nearly or, you know, all the words that basically devalue the commitment to what we're saying. You know, I'll be there around noon versus I'll be there at noon. So in, in the CSR pages, it manifests in the form of we aim to do this. You know, our ambition is our goal as opposed to our deadline for eliminating the use of this pesticide is this calendar date, you know, there's a big difference to that. So just recognizing the difference in um, something that's been lawyered to death, so it has no meaning versus something that has a firm commitment, which is, which is how I came across uh, the Cheesecake Factory's list of, uh, uh, you know, sustainability initiatives. It, I've never eaten at the Cheesecake Factory. I was supposed to for the, you know, an early outline for the book was like, I'm eating and I'm having a BLT at the Cheesecake Factory somewhere in Ohio. And then let's go to like, a, I think I was going to go to a potato farm somewhere in Ohio. Obviously that didn't happen, but I, I, I remember hearing like, oh, the Cheesecake Factory does better on these issues. And you could just look, you know, look at the difference between that sort of like, look, we're going to try to do something about slavery, but hey, what are you going to do? Versus here are all these guidelines. Here's what we've learned so far. Here are our deadlines. Uh, the second is... Avoid self-certification, which is something yeah, that happens something... a lot. <laughs> I see it. Yeah, and this is, it's not always the worst thing in the world, right? But the bigger the company, the less they want any oversight, um, I mean, I recently encountered this on, um, I was working on a story about carbon labeling, which is relatively new, where you do a, an assessment on the carbon footprint of a, of a product or service and use that in your branding or marketing. Uh, and uh, Oatly and uh, Corn are two brands that have started doing this, right? So Oatly brand oat milk now has the carbon footprint of that product, which if you don't know what your carbon footprint should be per day or per cup of oat milk, it's relatively uh, unhelpful information. But 
uh, if more brands start doing this, then there's a compare and contrast. And there's a sense of like, oh, is our brands trying to lower their carbon footprint because they recognize that we care about this stuff? Or you have uh, so sticker shock going, and you look at it and you're like, whoa, that's really high. Should I be buying this? Yeah, for, or, or, or the two balance each other out, right? The sticker shock of the carbon footprint versus perhaps a product that costs more because it wasn't shipped from an area on the planet where human labor uh, is cheap. Uh, but as I was researching that story, I found, you know, these smaller companies that were using these handful of certification bodies. Meanwhile, Unilever, which is, you know, global manufacturer of, I can't remember all, but like Tetley's Tea and haagen or maybe not haagen but either way, Sunlight, they, they have like 70,000 products. They announced they're going to start doing this and they have some, again, they have a time, I got in touch with them and they're like, well, we're hoping to do this much by the year, end of the year, and but we don't really even know. And, you know, and then the, the other question is great. So what third party body, a non-governmental organization is, is looking over this for you? Well, we're working a variety of people and, and our experts. And, you know, I, I obviously, I hope they push forward and do something that has teeth in it. But when you're looking at the page and it says, uh, you know, fair trade coffee, according to these companies that certify fair trade coffee versus we work directly with growers and we have these experts for the university of whoever who look over our stuff and you can trust us because we're a brand name and brands love you and you love brands. Right. And uh, the third is the, I is, think the most challenging part, which is the asking questions, right? Uh, where does this come from? And uh, it's always difficult because no one wants to be, or nobody should have to be a detective. Or, or an investigative reporter to eat dinner. And, and furthermore, right around the time that I think a lot of Americans started caring about where their food came from, and particularly post uh, recession, you know, around 2010, 2011, when people also had the money in their pockets again for the first time in a few years to be able to say, yeah, I'm going to pay a little more for stuff that's local, sustainable, organic, that fantastic and yet unfortunate Portlandia skit landed the is it local uh, skit which is it's or a sketch um, which is fantastic right i've seen it a hundred times it's great both of them fred armison and carrie brownstein they're fantastic in that but that you know the customers who are i think his shtick in the scene is just no matter how many questions the server answers he just keeps going yeah it, it, and is it local and that you know that was an appropriate that was a perfect parody of the obnoxious version of the ethical consumer uh, the problem is now we all kind of have this need to be some type of ethical concerned consumer because uh, government has let us down, right? In, in the last decade, sorry, but we're, we're not meeting our Paris Climate Accord levels and the, the companies and brands are going, yeah, we're all trying, mean, we're, we're in the process right now, right? They're, they're meeting in, in Scotland right now and they're setting these lower emissions levels, but like, we're all in this position where the larger organizations that are supposed to be um, running their companies and their societies to prevent the earth from being destroyed are basically saying, yeah, but I'm, you have to look at the next quarter uh, revenues or I have to look at the next election cycle. So we are left to go like, all right, I, I do kind of need to be asking these these questions. And, uh, you know, the good news is you don't you can do it without being a jerk about it. And, and you can get... also do it without um, using it as a signaling mechanism. And we, we will link this uh, Portlandia mm. skit in the show notes so everybody can watch it who doesn't have the context. But I think that that's also a, a thing that has transpired since that became something that, oh, I saw my friend ask the person at the table, is, is the broccoli organic? And then it became something, uh, oh, well, why am I not asking that question? But I think it didn't come with the education of why it's important to know these information pieces. And then it just becomes proliferated and becomes a meme where it's like, oh, you roll your eyes when someone now asks where something comes from. Cause it's like, are they actually yeah. trying to figure something out or are they doing it as a, as a signal at the table? I, I mean, I think that last part is just an unfortunate element of how fast communication works in, in our society, because that Portlandia sketch I feel is, like that's the Lucy and the chocolate factory of Correct. the earlier, early 2000s. Like that, that really, as you said, like that became a meme overnight. 
um, too fast, fa faster than the public's ability to sort of have their own conversation about why does it matter where food is coming from? And I think it's a fine thing to bring up things at the dinner table that are new or uncomfortable or challenging. I mean, I had to, I remember I had to fight, not fight, I had to negotiate hard <laughs> with an editor. Uh, I used to do a, a, a newspaper column where I would have people over to my house for dinner and I'd interview them over dinner in sort of a dinner party setting. And I would try to, you know, have something new every week. And I wanted to, I wanted to do something uh, about abortion uh, with a doctor who did abortions. And I remember my boss saying, uh, Corey, this is like, we're on the same page, but I don't know if this is appropriate for a food column. And I said, like, look, it's going to be in, like, it's going to be in good taste. I'm not going to make, I'm going to temper my usual impulse to be a uh, smart mouth. And uh, I'm just, gonna, I just want to, I just want to talk about the idea that like at the dinner table, we can talk about grown up stuff that matters to our lives. So uh, you don't want to be the person, first of all, making your server feel uncomfortable when they have a lot to do, that they have to answer questions or take up too much of their time or that they're being interrogated or, 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 or uh, treated with suspicion. And, and second of all, you don't want to do it in the sort of virtue signal way that tells your friends, you people don't know about this stuff. If anything, um, I don't mind being embarrassed, sort of bringing up some of this stuff to have people say, oh, what's the deal with that? What's that about? And then you can have these questions, whether it's about where it's coming from or uh, how tips are divided in, in the restaurant. Um, but always, always with, somebody said, somebody had a nice phrase to me the other day, always with um, some velvet on the end of the gavel. <laughs> I'd never heard before, but I like that idea of like, look, I get it. No, like we're talking about uncomfortable stuff. So let's try to be charming while we're doing it because we don't, the, the word, the, the least desirable outcome is to bring up a difficult topic just to alienate people. The important part is to bring up the idea that these things matter and not just to each other, but to the restaurant to send the signal to like, Hey, customers care about these things. We could spend the rest of the interview talking about this. I'm going to, I'm going to transition us in a second, but I, I will bring up one. You want to talk about recently... 1960s? <laughs> we could, we could. The, a, a good example of this that doesn't, require the front of house team to be a walking encyclopedia was at a at a restaurant called Adamix that I enjoyed a meal at recently where each dish and they called it because they didn't want servers to stand at your place on the counter and explain too long because of covid they would include a card with each dish and on the front of it was it's a korean restaurant so they had a korean graphic designer design the front and on the back it was the name of the dish where all the stuff came from, the name of the Korean ceramicist that made the thing. And this is a two-star Michelin restaurant, and they only serve 25 people a night, so it's very easy for them to to do something like this. But it's something where I have seen, I think Blue Hill at Stone Barns does something similar, where they give you a like a book uh, at the start of your mm -hmm. meal where it includes a lot of information about here are the purveyors that we're using. We've seen this also rise in popularity at places that are larger than just fine dining spots. But... Um, I find that that helps the, the staff not feel like they have to be that source of knowledge because the information is coming from a single source and it's here and you don't feel like you have to come up with an answer on the fly because so-and-so is being, being demanding on table 26. Communication is always key. And what you're describing is almost a full circle of something that started about 15 years ago. I remember the first time I went to uh, Momofuku, the noodle bar in New York. I was there for a friend's wedding and we had one afternoon and I said, I've heard about this, you know, this ramen place. It was, you know, I lived, I lived in Toronto. So I figured, well, it's going to be five years before this trend makes it to my city. So, uh, but I remember uh, I flipped over the menu on the back, had the name of, uh, you know, the, the pork producer in Tennessee or wherever it was in a variety, listed a number of farms. It was the first time I had seen that despite the fact that at the time I was working in a restaurant and, it, you know, the people in the kitchen could have told you where stuff came from, but we never communicated that to the front of the house. And um, over the next few years, that became incredibly common, almost predominant in the sort of urban chef-driven restaurants, certainly in the nose-to-tail trend 
that flowed from you know before the global recession and, and really trailed after it, and then it went away. It went away. Um, I, I would say within a few years of the recession, I'm, I'm not going to say Fred Armisen is directly to blame, but I think it's part of that. That was part of that trend of like getting people to care and starting to talk about the farmer, and then all of a sudden it became gauche. It became bourgeoisie to say, oh, look at us talking about our, isn't it local? Um, and, you know, and two things happened. People stopped paying attention and a certain segment of the dining population just kind of gave the benefit of the doubt to a lot of restaurants. I remember kind of around five years ago, a lot of people saying, well, I went to this restaurant. I just kind of assumed everything's like local and organic because they're like, they're good people, right? Like it's, it's one of those restaurants. It's one of those good restaurants. Uh, and, and not that restaurateurs were sort of taking advantage of that, but there is there was this sort of unspoken thing of like, well, I guess everybody's on the up and up and supporting local agriculture when that was not the case at all. But I think we come full circle to what you're talking about where, and maybe it's just in the higher end, you talk about Bluestone and is it Atomics or Atomics? I'd say Atomics. But atomics okay. might also be what it's called because and and the reason that I say this is because at a boy is their like first outpost that was mm. a little bit more casual. Um, that makes sense. So, you know, might be might be one that way. That makes or the other. sense. People will correct way, us in the, the comments. <laughs> but the two examples you're citing are both restaurants that have the sort of uh, the bandwidth to devote to that kind of messaging. Uh, I still think it's possible uh, through. I don't know. I, I think it's a difficult dis discussion of fine tuning it, but you've got, you know, you've got your server, you've got the physical printed menu, you've got the website, you've got the social media, you have all these avenues to get these messages at the consumers. So I, I guess it has, I guess it's more what they call omni channel of like, get this messaging in at every opportunity, rather than just sort of leave it to the overworked server who has too many tables to have to answer all these questions. Speaking of, of guests, just in general, you have this quote at the start of the book that I really wanted to get your thoughts on. You say, quote, the most important action we can take to contribute to a more equitable restaurant industry is to let go of the idea that the customer is always right, end quote. Can you expand on that? I'm glad to expand on that. I think, uh, yeah, it was something that... It's something I started thinking about very late in the book. I think I wrote the introduction and the first chapter, and then I started writing all the chapters more or less in a linear fashion. And I went back, obviously, writing is rewriting, and it's, it's editing. And very late in the process, um, without trying to make the book any longer than it needed to be, I couldn't get away from I, – I think just the phrase came up, you know, like the customer is always right in conversation somewhere. And, and I, I just remember kind of snapping and going, I think that's the problem. I, I think that attitude embraced um, not just as a sort of a snappy axiom that you sort of say, like, if you've got time to lean, you've got time to clean, like, Hey, let's, let's always put this first, but as an all encompassing, as an all encompassing philosophy that determines so much of how people behave both the staff of a restaurant and the customers of a restaurant. Cause it's like, it's what you teach everybody. It's, it's how you inform their, their perception of the environment. And it leads to all these bad outcomes, right? And that's, that's what, that's what tells, that's what signals customers that they are not unreasonable in feeling entitled, right? The idea the customer is always right. That's nuts. Imagine a doctor saying, like, the patient's always right. What are you talking about? Why, does the, why is the patient always right? Um, if the patient was always right, they'd be, uh, they'd be the doctor. Uh, and, and telling that to the staff, you know, is, is subjugating them, right? It's telling them to always put their needs, even if it's about their own personal safety, below the customer's satisfaction. So just mentally dismantling that, I think, is a big and possibly the easiest, the, the most cost-effective thing we can do to help restaurants. Like if we love restaurants and we're kind of casting about, because this is, you know, what led me to write this book was feeling frustrated. Like, I love restaurants. I used to be a cook. I used to be a restaurant critic. Like, obviously, I love restaurants. And I just grew more and more uh, dissatisfied with what I knew to be 
happening inside restaurants. And I was like, well, can I find some better way of finding where to eat that makes me feel good about the whole process? And often like telling people, well, go and do your research, but where they source shrimp or read through their CSR page or find restaurants near these do no tipping. We have the variety of things that I'm advocating for in the book. Here's the one that will not cost you one single penny. It's, it's about just sort of, you know, what they call in addiction recovery programs, making a, a, a fearless moral inventory. You know, just like looking inside yourself and going, what has been my expectation when I've walked into a room and thought, I'm right. <laughs> and all these people who are not my employees, who are not my family members, um, they all work for me, especially because I get the cha-ching show at the end of the night. What a big shot I am. You have this great tip, and I'm going to read it. Read another quote here, really quick, because uh, because it provides some context for the for the recommendation, which is, "quote Worse when we uphold, or as most odious diners do, flaunt our ability to punish or reward restaurants and their staff, not merely through our choice to dine there, but through tipping and Yelp reviews. It's an abuse of power. The threat of bad online reviews or withholding of tips is a shakedown. When our friends and dining companions exhibit these behaviors, it's our obligation to correct them, end quote. So it's almost like you're advocating for this uncomfortable uh, display of um, corrective behavior as well, because it's, it's once, once we manage to grapple with those inner moral questions, we have to then make sure that they proliferate to the other people that we're eating with, too. I think that's part of our social responsibility. I mean, nobody wants to be the bad guy. Nobody wants to tell other people that what they're doing is wrong. But we all have it within ourselves to do that nicely. Like, if you can ask someone to take their shoes off before coming in your home, you know, to wash your, their hands before picking up your baby, or any of the things that we sort of impose on other people that might otherwise seem uh, beyond our rights. Like we can have these delicate conversations with friends. And I, I include that because I think that sometimes just like challenging our friends is our only opportunity to advocate for change in the world. You know, we only get to vote so often and um, we're not, it's not frequent enough that we have a referendum on our, on our values, but I think something that many of us have been advised to do in the last couple of years, you know, particularly around issues of diversity and inclusion is like when you're with your group of friends who are kind of all of the same ethnicity or gender, like not letting people get away with shit. Um, I had I had a conversation actually with someone that I got to work with the other day, a young person in their early 20s who's saying like, the guys I grew up with, like, half of them, like we all um, were in touch because we played video games online. So we like wear headsets and talk to each other for two hours every night. Like half of them have fallen down this sort of rabbit hole of like anti-vaxxers, misogyny, you know, this sort of bundle of, of um, conspiracy theory, uh, uh, reactionary politics because they're young dudes and they've, they've, they've grown up this way. And, and he was talking about like, it's hard for me both because um, I want to enjoy the time I spend with my friends and not hang out with these guys who I kind of don't like anymore. But also I'm like, I feel like if I give up on them, they're never going to change. Like, and I'm their last link to the world of reality and verifiable facts. Um, so, you know, that's a kind of dark example. And most of us in the sort of dining class are a little older than that. But I, I think it's a similar thing. Like you go up to eat, it's three couples. You're having a nice time. I don't think it's the worst thing in the world to say, I believe this thing, uh, whether it's about you know, the, the inequality of tipping or talking about where your food comes from, like, hey, it's okay, because maybe nobody else in your life is reminding you or having a conversation that like, no, you tipping extra at the end of the night doesn't get to treat your server like crap or sexually harass them or whatever the issue is. Well, I think what you lay out so well. And the reason that I think it would encourage people to read the book is, or at least come up with some sort of mental framework or set of rules for yourself is that I have friends that I'll go out to dinner with and they'll ask rhetorical questions at the table. And 
you know, get, getting the conversation going is one thing, but I think what you've laid out you so have well to, is like you have to give me an example of this. What, what well, do you mean so, by asking rhetorical questions? So, like, um, should 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 we be eating this? Um, I don't know. It's like a clearly like super large. Uh, or no, no, no. So there's an example that that happened Shark recently. Where, sandwich. Yeah, maybe not shark fin sandwich, but like a like a uh, it's it's clearly not from a from a um, local place or there. It's it's like a uh, my my friend calls them like Chernobyl chickens, where they're just like <laughs> completely mm-hmm. uh, modified beyond beyond belief. And and um, you know it's h- kind of hard to parse between what's a joke and what's not. But like that's when the virtue signaling happens. I find when it's like, mm-hmm. hey, should we should we know where this is coming from or um, should, should we have talking to this, spoken to this person like this? I think your position of coming up with almost like a set of principles that you follow can sometimes be more helpful because then you are more likely to speak up and, um, give this person another option. Cause if they don't know, they don't have anybody in their life that's trying to influence them positively. You end up with the person like your, your friend's friends where they end up just taking the closest influence that they can. And that's unfortunately not always positive. Sometimes you're the only person in someone's life telling them uh, a certain message. Um, and, you know, there's like, like, there's just a nice way to do it. And the example you, you say, like, if, if that question is being out loud, asked out loud to the server, should we be ordering this? We know where it's from. Um, I'm reminded by, uh, um, there's a lot of wisdom and I think I quote him in the book, but, uh, I believe I quote him as Judge John Hodgman. Uh, he is not an actual judge, but a, a writer and, and a podcast host who hosts a, co- uh, a show called Judge Hodgman. And um, I, I, I remember a case about um, a dad, an annoying dad, who wherever they went uh, would ask for the Kung Pao chicken, whether it was uh, a Chinese restaurant or a Mexican restaurant or a toll booth. And he just thought it was really funny. Um that he had this, you know, recurring gag that he, you know, and, and the case was brought against him by his son or daughter. It was like, this is annoying and it's embarrassing. And the ruling ultimately was that like people in the service industry are at your mercy, uh, whether it's the chambermaid or a server, they're in a position where not that you have complete power over them, but they're dependent on your goodwill, particularly if it's a tipped environment and they don't really have the option of saying no or of being honest that you're not funny and you're causing them to have to sit around or stand around longer than they need to because they have other work to do, other tables to attend to. Uh, don't put people in a position to, to remind you that you're funny or clever. That's creating emotional work for people that you know need to be doing. So I think that form of it where you're trying to make a joke of it, like the server's going to be in on the joke, which is a joke against their workplace, uh, that seems kind of cruel and unnecessary, but at the same time, I don't think it's—I don't think there's anything wrong with saying, "Where's it? You know, where's the chicken from?" And you know, I, I lay out that list of reactions in the book, all of which I've gotten over the years. Uh, and, you know, they guess they're like, "You know what? I'm not sure. Let me go check." And they come back, "Oh, here's the name of the farm. Great." And when they say, "I don't know," you go, "Oh, that's okay. We'll order something else." You know, like that enough, like quick five second interaction is enough to you to make your decision, but also to signal to the server, to the restaurant, to your friends, like, Oh, great. Like this stuff matters to me. I don't want to make a federal case of it, but if I can't get an answer, then I don't want to support that product. Cause it's a, it's a vote that you can cast with your wallet that doesn't necessarily get tracked in a dashboard or on, um, TV at, at six o'clock in the evening where it's like, so and we got so-and-so number of votes for this. It just becomes something that mm. over time ends up getting changed, which is really, really interesting. Yeah. And that, you know, that, that voting with your wallet ultimately was the, was the thing I really wrestled with over the course of, of writing uh, the book and researching it and speaking to people. I mean, I didn't really, as a beginning, I kind of set out with that being the purpose and I ended up really wrestling with like, the problem of the limitations of voting with your wallet, right? Because ultimately we don't get to affect that much change, right? And it's, it's frustrating. It's the same as true as of voting with your vote. You know, you only get to do 
that so often, which is why I ended up speaking, you know, with, with policy people about, okay, so what happens when you actually try to affect political change? But I think any, try to, any kind of change you're trying to make in the world, uh, it matters and it's worthwhile. I want to shift gears a little bit to talking about working in restaurants, because as I kind of shared before we turned the mics on, there's there are a lot of sous chefs and line cooks and culinary school students that, that listen to the show. And so you lay out this really, really interesting paradox. Quote, when cooks complain of the monotony of their tasks, chefs remind them that while they are they aspire to artistry, they are, for now, skilled tradespeople who should take pride in perfection and pleasure in repetition. Then, when they complain about low wages, that they are not paid like electricians, plumbers, or any other skilled tradespeople, a chef will reverse course to remind them that they are artists and must suffer for their creative pursuits, end quote. How do you grapple with that? I mean, the way that I grappled with it was to get out of the industry and into another industry. Um, and now to try to have that conversation, both with diners and with workers. And it, it's always uh, difficult in my writing. I, I, I try to, two things I try to do when I'm writing, particularly when I either get writer's block or I just try to figure out what's the right way to say the thing I'm trying to say is one, I, I read out loud everything, you know, so it sounds kind of conversational. Two is if I don't know how to say it, I always get up out of my chair and I go, what are you trying to say and who are you trying to say it to? And sometimes it's a real conflict because you know, no editor is writing for specifically uh, a type uh, of worker in a specific field, unless it's a trade magazine. In general, editors are going to say, this is for the general public. Don't make it too inside. But at the same time, I'm like, I do want to speak to the workers, people people like actually toiling away in restaurants uh, at such a variety of levels. Um, I, I mean, but again, there's all the different genres of restaurants, but in the chef driven restaurant. And when you speak with anyone in, in that field, they're like, yeah, I know what you're talking about. You don't have to elucidate any further. Um, that is a, maybe not uh, ubiquitous, but it is an incredibly common managerial style, right? As soon as people are like, oh man, we do the same thing every day. And they're like, hey man, an electrician doesn't complain about the, doing the same thing every day. You got to do it precisely the same because it matters because if you do it wrong, it could be an electrical fire. And if we do something wrong, somebody could get poisoned or even worse, they could have a meal that wasn't perfect, which is unthinkable. And then as soon as you start, you go like, um, it's, uh, as soon as you start going like, but the people in that field, like they get paid two or three times what I make. So I'm not a skilled trade, even though I'm recognized, uh, by, you know, the college of, skilled trades as a skilled trade and I have my red seal, you know, then it comes back, uh, well, we're artists. Come on. I mean, if all you want is to make money, go somewhere else. Uh, I don't know where this mercenary attitude is coming from. Perhaps you don't have the passion to make it in this no kitchen. You know, everyone else here, everyone else here, they have the passion. You know, Steve over there, he came in two hours early at, yesterday. Not that I asked him to, not that I would ever ask him to. And if the labor board ever comes around investigating, I never asked anyone to do that. Everyone here comes in voluntarily two hours every day. But, you know, that's just kind of the sort of pimpology. And I think sometimes even unconsciously that a lot of chefs uh, exhibit as managers, I think, because that's what was done to them, because it's the it's the psychological trick that's necessary to avoid people just looking at the, the reality of it, right? Like it is creative, but it is also repetitive. Um, and, and you can't really square those two things unless you say the product is worth much more than we've been charging. So let's charge more and then we'll pay more, which is part of what's happening right now anyways. In You have a, a reference that you kind of touch on and this is talking about working for, um, you know, high temper, high, um, strong, we'll call it chefs. You're, you're referencing, um, um, what is, uh, the, the chef of the restaurant at Meadowood and you share quote, you'll find people in these kitchens who will say that they were treated and paid horribly, illegally. Even there are just as many who will say that the harsh conditions turned them into who they are today for which they are grateful and then you share that you could say the same. And uh, I'm not quite saying this quote as like a gotcha to you, but 
because it's something that I <laughs> grapple with too, because, you know, of, uh, of course the forge that was my restaurant experience made me a really hardened and skilled professional, but would I drop anyone into a single day of my nine years of restaurant experience? Probably not because it's only now after coming on the, down the other side of the mountain that I can look back with any positive sentiment, but is there a, like, are we getting to a level of progress where there is challenging moments to overcome and real skill development that can be possible to make sure that we have people that are operating at a really high level without any sort of these things that you touch on with harsh conditions or low pay or anything like that? Boy, now I know how Sarah Palin feels with that gotcha question. Though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, you know, you got to uh, yourself. I mean, I I'm you... just bringing it up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean that was much like the way you phrased it. It, it for yourself in the book. I was trying to be honest about like, hey, there are two sides to this coin. I don't just want to say staging is a totally unacceptable practice. I would never do it. I don't support it. On the other hand, I'm like, I, I've done it. I I would do it if I had the opportunity to do it today. In some way, it's obviously I'm not going to abandon my wife and child so I can go work for two months in Spain. Um, so, so one is two things can be true at the same time, right? Like something being contradictory doesn't make it untrue. I heard a good, uh, uh, a good, a good sort of storytelling uh, uh, guideline one time, a good story turns against the way it drives. You know, that's part of what grabs our attention. And sometimes those, sometimes those contradictions are what tells us like, there's meat on the bone, like this is worth investigating because it's not black and white. Um, a, a situation can be exploitative and also benefit you in the long run. Uh, but to answer your actual question, like is, is there some way to make that more equitable? I think that's a, that's a key question. And you know, the direction I go, and maybe this makes me unpopular, is uh, simplify the menu. Um, I think menus are too long. They're too complicated. I think we have, uh, the dining class has grown accustomed to a level of luxury, both in uh, cooking uh, and presentation and service that has only ever truly been achievable through taking advantage of the people making and serving the food. And the alternative to that doesn't have to be everyone, you know, making a pot of soup on Sunday and eating the same gruel all week um, or drinking um, uh, Soylent, uh, I think there is a slightly stripped down version of a contemporary restaurant that can complement both desires, you know, both our desire to go out to feel all the feelings we feel in a restaurant, right? To be satiated, to have something new, to be delighted, to be a little bit pampered by service, uh, to get together with friends, to be flattered by, by lighting and music and all these things, uh, while at the same time take care of employees. And, and I think this is the real key, not give them more work to do than is possible or reasonable in the time they have to do it. And, and as one chef owner put it to me, you know, part of the way to do that is to take your 30 item menu and cut it down to 16, right? And outsource some of those things that you have been too prideful to admit that you don't need to make yourself. You know, you don't need to make your own pickles and bread and butter. You don't, you know, things that result in you having to tell staff, well, if you got to come in two hours early to do it, you know, you just do what you got to do. Uh, you know, I'm just trying to get you up to speed. You know, it's the thing the chef says. I just, I just want to give you more to do in a day than you can do right now. So in six months, you're going to be ready for that promotion, right? Because you're going to be tougher and stronger and everything. Instead, I, I, you know, I think the alternative is just have the, the smaller, more compact menu that people can actually execute in a reasonable amount of time, which, again, is something we're seeing right now. You know, we started seeing it uh, – where I lived for the first uh, 45 years of my life in Ontario, uh, when there was, we started to see this a few years ago when there was a minimum wage increase and it was sizable enough that a lot of restaurants started saying like, I, if I'm going to pay more for each hour of labor, I think I need to have fewer hours of labor. So 
Why don't I give people a little less to do? How can I do that? Why don't I cut down my menu a little more? It's a challenge to the at, and another attitude that is part of the customer is always right, which is that there's something for everybody on every menu. Um, but I think that's that's a reachable challenge, you know. I mean, I think there absolutely should be something for most of us, like whether like when it comes to food restrictions, accommodating people. But the point at which your menu is, you know, 200 items to make sure that everybody has something. And as a result, everyone's running around like chickens with their heads cut off to produce it. Uh, it's unsustainable. What you're effectively advocating for, and this is kind of my last question before we get into some some rapid fire ones, in Seth Godin's words, is changing culture, and that's really hard, right? But, but you lay out the example that we used to have smoking and non-smoking sections in restaurants. That was just part of the culture. Even in hospitals, you you were able to smoke in hospitals or planes, and that's within recent memory, right? So we can all see that culture has changed in a relatively short time frame. So. I wanted mm -hmm. to know what you think is valuable or some potential resources that you've seen as great examples to keep in mind when one is thinking about changing culture. Great resources to keep in mind when you're thinking about changing culture. I don't think I have a quick answer to that question uh, or, or, or a pithy answer. I can only say that it's achievable. I think the example of smoking is one that, you know, we experienced in in our lifetimes and i reach for that one because i'm old enough to remember when it seemed inconceivable and when you know so many restaurateurs fought back against that wherever you are in canada or the united states and those risk you know and, and they were aided by the tobacco organization who had a financial interest against that change and it's not dissimilar now you know you've got the other the nra aka the other nra or restaurants canada these lobbying organizations that have always fought against the minimum wage um, for their own reasons. Um, but it's changing despite that. Uh, I mean, I think part of what I advocate for in the book is just thinking about these things and having conversations with friends uh, and changing our own personal behavior. But wherever you are, there are grassroots organizations trying to change things uh, for other people. Uh, and sometimes that's specifically a, uh, a labor movement, you know, uh, some a non-union organization or a union organization that's looking to organize workers. And sometimes it's just like a workplace that is changing the dynamic, right? A restaurant that's saying we're going to eliminate tipping or we're going to you know, one of the examples that really inspired me from the book is uh, Juliet and Peregrine in Boston, or just outside Boston, where in addition to a, a profit sharing with staff model, they they use an open book management system where, um, you know, in a typical chef-driven restaurants, you'd have staff meetings for wine, right, to make sure everybody knows the hell out of the wine so that they can sell the wine. I mean, that's the purpose, right? But it's all sort of... Um, very often framed in a sort of educational capacity, but you're not interested in like developing these great, the, the wine knowledge of the staff, you want them to be able to sell your expensive wine. And in the open book management system, it's about um, having meetings about how the business is run to train people to run a business and teaching them skills that carry them well beyond the positions where they are and the earnings that they have. Uh, so when you find these kinds of businesses, you know, I think that is uh, hand in hand with the sort of supporting some grassroots labor organization and saying, I'm, I, I want to give these people my money. I want to like find the kind of restaurants I really believe in and devote my dining dollars to them, particularly when, you know, most of us have, whether we budget or not, X amount of dollars that we spend eating out and a lot of people and what I use this phrase a lot, the dining class. I, I think you know what I mean by that, but people who like to eat out a lot and who can afford to eat out a lot, we're very fortunate in that regard. And often that dining class is led by the list, the top 10 lists and the top, you know, which are always, they're never framed in this way, but they're often the top 10 expensive restaurants. They're the top 10 restaurants that also have a, a, a big publicity, uh, budget and or company working for them. So just, you know, the 
the old Simpsons uh, uh, advice of just don't look. Um, just ignoring that circus is like the first step. And then the second is, okay, so if I just like don't allocate my dining daughters, dollars to this sort of top 10 list restaurant world, well, then I can really focus on like, hey, that restaurant that eliminated tipping or this like family that I got to know who makes this amazing Cambodian food or whatever the issue is you, you want to support. Um, saying like, why don't, if we eat out twice a week or we order in twice a week, why would I keep going back to those people and trying to like, cross off my list this scavenger hunt style dining and say, well, I've eaten there and I've eaten there. Yeah, this was okay. That was all right. Like why not money ball it and say, instead of playing the spread and trying to like have something from everybody, why don't you like, why don't I go for like the guaranteed wins? I know this place made us a great meal when we came in. It was a fantastic dining experience. Why wouldn't I go back there? I, I think I've been kind of singing that song for the last five years. Who wouldn't rather go, uh, back to a restaurant they already knew was great than a new restaurant, uh, considering the odds of having a good meal at a new restaurant. I want to do some rapid fire questions with you. Okay. Is there an ingredient that you're obsessed with right now? I'm always obsessed with limes. I think lime is, is probably just, sorry, is that I'm already, I'm going on too long. Limes. No, no, <laughs> you can, because <laughs> you I, I, I was curious. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, Define I, I, rapid fire for me. Yeah, no, no, I mean, they're rapid fire questions. They don't have to be rapid fire answers. How about that? Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I love limes. Uh, I've always, it's, it's like when it's a matter of lemons and limes, I'm like, come on, lime is top dog. It's so versatile. And if there's any ever one ingredient that like I would feel uncomfortable if I ran out of, it's fresh limes. Is there a book? that's been particularly impactful in your career? You can talk about it from cooking or you could talk about it from writing or just journalism in general. Is there something that stands out? I mean, it's pretty trite, but obviously Anthony Bourdain's Kitchen Confidential was as big a, a hit on me as it was in other people. For me, I read it at a time where I'd gone to cooking school but wasn't cooking and it led me back to cooking. So it really inspired me to go like, from, you know, written from the perspective of like caring about food and caring about cooking and caring about doing a good job. And I managed, I, I managed to get all of that and it led me back to the kitchen of cooking without glamorizing, you know, drug abuse or, or macho behavior that I think are valid criticisms of that book. Those are unintended, but I think, you know, that book is kind of like the scar face of cooking memoirs and that so many people have somehow forgotten the addiction and destruction part of the story. Um, and the, in terms of writing, probably, well, Bourdain as well, because he was a brilliant writer. Um, but uh, Ruth Reichel's um, memoirs about being a restaurant critic for the LA Times and the New York Times. So uh, Comfort Me with Apples uh, and uh, Garlic and Sapphire. Uh, definitely the books that I was reading as I started out writing that um, had no expectation of succeeding in what I was doing, but I remember telling myself, like, if I ever got to do this job, this is how I would do it. I always frame this question as, you know, it's a Saturday morning or your your first day off, and you kind of walk into your kitchen and you're going to make eggs either for yourself or for your family. How do you make those eggs? <laughs> What's your preference? Well, it's not about my preference because I have a two-year-old. That's right. So... She, um, sometimes I ask her when I'm putting her to bed, what would you like for breakfast in the morning? And I'm almost asking her just because I want her to think about food and I'm also hoping I can hold her to it so we can have some plan in the morning. But she kind of has a handful of things she eats again and again. So she loves eggs and she'll frequently say egg or sassy, which means sausage. Sausage. Um, so her eggs are one egg, uh, just with salt and pepper. Uh, I'll grate a bunch of cheddar in there and then pan, medium heat, butter, let it get hot, put it in, uh, let it sizzle as soon as it solidifies in the bottom, fold it like an omelet, uh, and that's it. And she, um, she sometimes she wants it cut up, so she'll, she'll say cut, and sometimes she wants it whole, so she'll say big. Amazing, amazing. What's one thing that you've changed your mind on in recent memory? I never changed my mind. Stick to the no, that's, 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 <laughs> I, I heard some, there's some politician who I think like 
you know, every politician writes their sort of self-aggrandizing biography. Some politician who has the one called like never apologize or never regret anything. Oof. Um, uh, yeah, that's obviously like very childish uh, behavior and mentality. Uh, what's something I changed my mind? I mean, I regret everything. I I'm in a constant state of like, did I, did I do the right thing? It's, it's, it's more infrequent um, that I would feel really confident and certain that I, that I did the right thing. Um, it's a good way to live. Yeah. So, no. <laughs> Sorry, it it is. It I truly just... is. I mean, like, as we're getting more information than ever, that has to be a net good in my mind because it allows for us to, even if it's not necessarily like plant forever roots in an ideal, it's like at least you feel like your ideal is better informed. Well, I mean, this is why I'm still married. This is, I approach everything assuming I'm wrong, right? And then. <laughs> it, let, let me let me go into my sort of inventory and give you my reasons and if it turns out i'm right that's great but if i start off by telling you like i'm right and i'm just trying to like help you understand how i'm how i'm right and you're wrong like you know that's the, the divorce courts are full of couples uh particularly post-pandemic who who have that mentality so uh e even you know with the book and a lot of the stuff that i'm uh looking into i have to approach it with the attitude of like look i've been talking to people i've been investigating mm. these things but like i'm not a genius very much so and uh if i'm proven wrong on something then it's time to like it's it's never time to assume you're, you're the expert uh even though like as you accrue knowledge like people start coming to you for the answers um but you're constantly trying to learn about things and there's constant constant um exceptions to how things work um i mean i had somebody approach me recently to do some consult somebody is, is doing um wants to eliminate tipping in the restaurant and uh, they approached me about consulting and i've had people come to me a few times before just for advice i'm happy to share what i know this person actually approached me like professionally like can i hire you as a consultant i said sure great let's talk about it and one of the things they came up with was um they said they're trying to figure out the sort of real uh, practicalities of it. And they said, you know, I was thinking about, do I, um, if I sort of pay uh, a, a living wage was the goal, um, do I have to pay front of house a little more on Friday, Saturday to incentivize them to work those shifts? Because otherwise, why would they, why wouldn't they prefer to work on a slow night, even though our, you know, our service and our revenue is relatively um, static over, over, over the week. And uh, I, I mean, I just told him like, well, let me look into this because I don't have an answer for you. Um, I don't know offhand. Uh, and I'm still, such I'm still a good phrase. I don't know. <laughs> it's like, doesn't get doesn't get stated enough. Well, so long as it gets backed up with like, I care about it because you care about it. So let, let's try to figure it out, right? I mean, I'm going to do my diligence. I don't know. Yep. Yeah. I mean, it's better than the I don't know <laughs> the, sure. the sort of, I don't know. You asked a dumb question. I don't know really the answer to that. And if I don't know, it's not important. No, let me look into it. And I'm, I, you know, I'm going to talk to everybody I know because now that question matters to me too. You somehow get a call right after this interview that you've just won an all expenses paid trip to eat at your dream restaurant. And when you get there, mm -hmm. there's someone you've always wanted to talk with waiting to have dinner with you. What restaurant is mm -hmm. it? And who is that person? Wow. Well, <laughs> it's, 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 so we left uh, Toronto uh, mid pandemic. We moved to, to Winnipeg <clears throat> to be close to uh, my wife's parents because we have a small child. And, you know, we, the time we left, it was uh, early in the pandemic. We couldn't even hug people goodbye. It was a real, it was a real bummer. And I haven't been back since. And, uh, you know, that's where I lived my entire life until then. So if I was, going to go to any restaurant, I'd be going back there and I would be, probably be going to a place called Martin's Bakery, just not a restaurant, but a sort of quick service uh, Sri Lankan food shop in Scarborough where they make the best kotu roti. I've had uh, the, the cook, uh, it's got a flat top grill and they've got their like, um, I think they're uh, paint scrapers. 
that they use uh, for doing the cooking on the grill because they, they're able to really like dig under the, uh, or they might be like plaster spatulas, but either way, they're like, they're flipping and tossing all these onions and, and, um, and flat roti and mutton and chilies and lots of lime at the end. It's so good. It's so spicy. And it's like, it must be five pounds of food. This, <laughs> this dish uh, that they give you, um, it's, no, it's just, it's so fantastic. Uh, and if there could be anyone I could eat with, um, I'd probably be the last person I ate with, who is uh, my friend Ginsburg, who uh, like the last time I was able to actually go out in a restaurant just before the sort of curtain of the pandemic closed on us, we went on this trip around Scarborough, going to a few places. And we, we went there along with this um, Syrian bakery. And I had my, my little girl in the back seat while uh, I just wiped sweat from my brow. Um, and she was happy to just sit in the back seat with her soother. So I would probably just be looking to sort of like uh, almost time travel back to that last happy, carefree moment and that last meal, I guess is what I'm saying, before yeah, recreate our lives that. change this way. Yeah, yeah. yeah, not that you can pick up where you left off, although that'd be an interesting time travel story. Um, but that was certainly um, a, a, a footprint I'd like to walk in again. Last question for you, and, and I'll also use this as kind of a question to if there is something that you wanted to talk about, but we didn't get a chance to cover, and you can use that as a way to potentially frame your answer. But my, my question is, what do you think chefs can be doing better to help the next generation? I mean, I think to a certain extent, we've already seen a certain sea change. Um, and I don't know if that's what chefs are doing so much as what their employees are doing. Um, I mean, I've seen, I've seen a easily identifiable, if not measurable difference in the way that back of house staff thinks of themselves and thinks of their ability to voice objections to, you know, a variety of problems in the industry, you know, 10 years ago, it was unthinkable. And five years ago, there was maybe murmurs. What I'm finding today is that a lot of young people, they're just not going to put up with the shit. Five or 10 years ago, that same cohort thought they had to because of the inertia of change, you know, because of that mentality of this is the way things are, they're not going to change. You know, younger people just seem more aware um, of their legal rights and of their, their power. You know, when I, when I was starting as a, as a writer, um, I, I was writing for this uh, Alt Weekly, and this, uh, this boss, uh, it, it, in, a, in, a, in a manner that doesn't really bear relevance here, was taking advantage of me, was kind of screwing me over, and I didn't know what to do about it. And I, uh, I talked to this other editor, and he said, it doesn't really matter how this one goes. You just need to know you have more power than you think. And if you speak up, I know you're afraid. Like, if you object to this, you'll never work again. This person won't hire you, and they'll tell other people not to hire you. But I just need you to know, you're talented and hardworking, and you're just at the beginning of your career, and you shouldn't be afraid to stand up and say what's right or wrong. And you haven't been in the, this career long enough to know what industry norms are or what's right or wrong. And I don't want you to walk away from this experience thinking that this is normal. It's not, it's not okay. And however you handle it, just know you have more power than you think. And he was right about that. And of course I was too afraid to say anything and I let myself get taken advantage of, but I learned the lesson of long term and I learned that he was right. And I, I see so many young cooks who already know that now and partly you know, that's a real sort of revolution in youth culture that's taken place over the last couple of years where people are just not, not fearing the repercussions. You know, part of that has to do with like strength in numbers and people realizing that like they can stand up for their political beliefs and not fear that, that, that it's going to ostracize them because actually a lot of people, particularly people their age, believe the same things. And also, you know, they all found themselves out of work initially during the pandemic. And then suddenly, you know, in both Canada and the United States, like had government supports that at least prevented people from being uh, homeless or, or hungry. And for many 
young people, uh, or for many people, not so young, and people in their 30s found themselves not having to be in that work environment, not having to work 12 hours a day, not having to have their their physical and mental time devoted to that one thing for the first time in a decade for many people. And many people just kind of like had a mental break from it and went, oh, right, I don't have to do this thing, but also don't have to think that way. So uh, people are standing up for their rights. People are advocating for change. People are forming sort of ad hoc, not unions, but sort of worker advocacy groups and saying like, how can we make these changes in our workplaces and how chefs can change is just listening, right? Just listening, letting go first of their social power, you know, first of the idea like that the chef is their sort of parental figure and the staff are their children. Um, and then after that, letting go of some of the actual power, right? The, the, the chart, the hierarchy chart. Um, I, I think that's bare bones. I don't think we're going to nationalize restaurants. Um, I, I've certainly I, I've talked to restaurateurs who are converting to an employee ownership model, which is great. I don't think too many places are going to do that. Um, but cooks in a room that is working super hard, where everybody's super talented, and everyone's feeling like crap because they're treated badly, those people know, and if they don't, they need to know, they could all walk out the door and get a job across the street tonight because they are so much in demand. So they don't have to put up with that crap. And, you know, the one thing chefs can do right now, like if they could do one thing that doesn't cost them anything, is just facing that truth. They no longer have a monopoly on their guru status and control over the young people who were flooding into kitchens post-recession and post sort of five or 10 years of food network feeding them recruits. And they're no longer getting the same people in the same volume. Uh, so they can just sort of face those facts and saying they have to change uh, or they're going to be out of their ass. Amen. Corey, where can people find the book? Where can people go to follow you or um, get in touch if they have further questions? Please, please feel free to direct people. Uh, my book, The Next Supper, colon, The End of Restaurants as We Knew Them, comma, and What Comes After, Positivity, is available wherever you buy books. Um, you can go to coreymince.ca, that's uh, Corey with an E, uh, and mince with a Z, or a Z, as it is pronounced, in the United States of America, and that's got all sorts of links for um, uh, where to buy the book, and you can find me online at the usual uh, 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 social medias, the Twitter and the Instagram under my name and uh, hey, anybody who ever has questions about restaurants, uh, particularly if it's about, do I have to put up with this crap from my boss? Uh, feel free to get in touch with me. Thanks so much for being here. Is there any closing thoughts, any last kind of points that you want to leave people with? Otherwise I really, really appreciate you taking the time. I always tell people to stay in school and don't do drugs. And I think that uh, that message is uh, the time has uh, proved me right on that. But no, I, I know we've gone over your usual time, so I feel flattered uh, that uh, this, this conversation was worth it to you, and I hope it is to the listener as well. I highly, highly recommend the book to anybody who is interested in just overall industry history and happenings and case studies and stories. You did a really, really phenomenal job with it. And I, as I said at the top of the interview, I really enjoyed reading it. So thank you for... What's up? Justin here again. Because, I mean, if you're still listening, you didn't not like this episode, right? And if that's the case, I'd like to think that you'd get value from the other work that I share here online. It's all focused on helping chefs and hospitality professionals perform better. If you don't have a lot of time, the best place to start is with the email newsletter that I write every single week called the 80-20 Edge. That's where I share knowledge on sharpening your skills, asymmetric upside, and exploring the industry beyond the status quo. And I say it saves time because I include all of the content that I published that week all in one place as kind of a weekly digest of sorts. Next up, you should check out my YouTube channel for gear reviews, clips from podcasts just like this one, and documented experiences from some of the best restaurants in the world. And lastly, if you'd like to learn about my intense cohort-based professional development focused course, get coaching from me to help you make your next move, or just support the show, you can check out justinconnacom slash support. And if you do support this show already, that's greatly appreciated. Thank you. Finally, it really does help to share a review of this show on Apple Podcasts to help the podcast universe know that people like us like shows like this. And until the next episode, my name is Justin Kana, and I hope you have a good one.